seminar. I'm Hei Wai Tang, the director of the institute. Um, and uh, this seminar series aims uh, to bring in thought leaders in the region, uh, in Asia, and around the world, uh, uh, you know, for people who study Asia to come to Hong Kong U uh, to share their experience and research uh, about uh, you know, global issues uh, from Asian perspectives. Uh, and today, I'm very glad to have a good friend of mine, uh, Chris Lert uh, Sam Safem Farek, uh, who is a professor of economic and public policy in the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the UCSD, uh, uh, University of California, San Diego. Um, and we didn't bring him all the way uh, from California. Uh, he has been working uh, in uh, Thailand for many years as, as an advisor for Bank of Thailand. Uh, the central bank there. Um, he helped uh, Bank of Thailand to essentially set up the research unit for them and I, we just had a long chat with him. He spent around uh, a quarter of the year uh, advising the Bank of uh, Thailand uh, in addition to the rest of the time uh, where he is a professor uh, in, in California. Um, so Chris, uh, let me just call him directly by first name, uh, is an expert in finance public policy and economic development uh, with regional specialization in Southeast Asia. We met in Singapore uh, a few months ago uh, and I was so impressed uh, by the book that he has been writing for the last few years, uh, going to be published by MIT Press. It is, in my opinion, the first book studying uh, the past and the present as well as the future economic development in Southeast Asia. As we all know, uh, this is a region where uh, we need to understand more uh, Hong Kong obviously uh, remains to be uh, sort of the gateway between China and the rest of the world, but increasingly with uh, an emerging, uh, fast-growing economy in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, we, we need to know more in order to understand uh, the economic and business opportunities uh, for people here, uh, and uh, for, also for the Hong Kong government who understands you know, how we can play the role uh, as uh, the bridge uh, between China and Southeast Asia. Uh, so Chris wrote this wonderful book, um, which uh, has 17 chapters. Uh, 20 now. <laughs> uh, 18 now, uh, touching on topics ranging from obviously it's growing, it's growing, yeah. trade, investment, finance, whatever. But he's going to share with you uh, more about the details of the book. Uh, so my job is very easy, uh, basically just to introduce him. But I also want to introduce the 14 Asia Global Fellows here, uh, who came from 14 countries, uh, who have uh, already spent all, more than a month uh, in Hong Kong, and they just came back from Bangkok, uh, where Chris just flew in from yesterday. Uh, and they're going to go to Beijing and Shenzhen uh, in the next two weeks um, uh, and to understand you know, what's going on in China as well. So if you have time, please uh, interact with them. And we got uh, one of the fellows uh, to be the moderator for the second half of today's uh, sharing, uh, Sanjeev Sharma, uh, who actually uh, worked in Hong Kong uh, for many years. Uh, his previous job was executive director of Microsoft uh, in Hong Kong, originally from Singapore experts on digital economy and platform economy. Uh, and uh, like Chris, uh, he also got a degree from U of Chicago. Oh, I didn't know um, that. <laughs> uh, uh, but he didn't have a PhD, so Chris has a PhD uh, in economics. But without further ado, let me turn the stage to Chris, uh, who is going to give a presentation about Southeast Asia. Right, uh, thank you very much for the, for the introduction. Things keep uh, changing quite, quite a lot. Right. In, in the past several years. Uh, the the uh, course that I have been teaching at UC San Diego, I have been teaching a course on, on Southeast Asian economies. The first time I taught that class was in 2003. And then from 2003, of course, Myanmar was not even open uh, yet. Right? And later on it was open, I had to change my slide a lot. And then of course now it's back again. Uh, this region has been quite dynamic, so it's quite interesting. It, it's very fun to, to work on this one. Uh, the problem is that now I have to uh, try to finish it and, and, and move uh, and move on. Okay. The book covers pretty much almost aspect of Southeast Asia. It's um, 18 chapters uh, so far. Uh, we are not going to do that today, of course, right? So I'm going to just give you overview of the landscape of the of the region. Uh, some of you might know the region quite well. Some of you may not know the region uh, as much, but uh, I will give you some, some landscape and then uh, open uh, the floor for Q&A. And then we, uh, I think it's going to be more fun to, to have Q&A because we can go deep in certain uh, issue uh, rather than presenting something uh, in detail uh, for a particular issue. Okay. So if you uh, look at uh, Southeast Asia, right? so how important it is, this is 
Southeast Asia in global perspective. Try to think about this. Okay? Southeast Asia, if you think about Southeast Asia, the whole region as one economy. And we should try to think about that as well. Because Southeast Asia, this organization uh, in this region is called uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is ASEAN. And right now, the integration in terms of economic is quite uh, strong. So we try to uh, think that, okay, this is one uh, big economy. Uh, in terms of surface area, uh, it ranks uh, number seven. Okay. Um, and population, it ranks number three. And this is very important because I'm going to come back to this one. Uh, actually, I'm not going to come back. I'm going to tell you right now because if we run out of time, then we will not come back. Population of Southeast Asia altogether is 700 uh, million. Right? So if you think about Southeast Asia as a whole economy, it ranks number three uh, after China and India. Or right now it's India and China. India is already uh, number one, right? And this is very important because you have India and China, number one and number two, and Southeast Asia, number three, which is the region that sits right between India and China. So you look at this region of the world. This is where the activities are happening. Okay? And of the activities, Southeast Asia is right in the middle between the, the uh, two largest economies in the world. Okay? In terms of uh, GDP, this is not per capita, it's total uh, size of the economy. Uh, it's number five. So it's in, in any uh, standard, it's quite uh, important uh, region that we should look at. But if you zoom in into the region, there are 11 countries. Okay, this is the map. I'm not going to go in detail. But you're going to see that this region is very diverse. If you travel around Southeast Asia, you're going to see there was culture, there was political regime, and so on. But in terms of the economy, uh, everything is also diverse, starting from, from the the area. Right? Indonesia is huge, it's almost half, and you have Singapore, which is, uh, is very small right here. Right? So you have countries that tie together within ASEAN, but they're so heterogeneous, and that's another problem that we're going to, to touch. Right? Uh, ASEAN is an association that members are quite heterogeneous. Okay? So if you look at uh, population, of course, Indonesia, uh, largest one, uh, 200 something, almost 300 uh, million population. Then you have uh, Brunei, which is tiny. It's about like 400, 500,000. Uh, right? uh, it's more like a village if you try to think it that way. Uh, and then uh, Timor Leste, also about a million. And then Singapore uh, is about six, uh, five, six, six, seven million. Right? Population, very uh, different. So you have huge country, Indonesia, and you have like tiny country uh, uh, like Singapore as well. And the GDP per capita, uh, uh, sorry, this is GDP, the share of GDP. Indonesia is the largest economy. Right? We try to think about Southeast Asia, a lot of people talk about Singapore with the highest income and so on, but in terms of size, size actually matters, and, and Indonesia is like account for like 40%. So it means that the action, if you try to think about what's going on, Indonesia is the largest share. Right? So you cannot think about Southeast Asia without thinking about what happened in uh, Indonesia. Okay? Uh, followed by uh, Thailand, and then the Philippines, Malaysia, right? and then uh, Vietnam is up and coming. Right there. Okay. Uh, how rich uh, they are. Right? This one is per capita GDP, so it's not just the size, but it's, it's per capita. When you look at this, you try to compared with, with the world, which is the largest, uh, the, the last uh, column, then overall Southeast Asia is not that rich. You travel around Southeast Asia, usually you see like big cities, right? You travel to Singapore, you travel to, to Bangkok, to Kuala Lumpur, uh, to Jakarta, and, and even Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, you see skyscrapers everywhere. Even right now uh, in, in Phnom Penh, in Cambodia, you see a lot of skyscrapers. It seems like this region is developed. Right? But if you look at the region as a whole, Right, the, the areas that you haven't been to, like the rural area, the outer islands in Indonesia, this region is not that rich. Right? Uh, for example, Thailand, people used to think that my country, people used to think, oh, Thailand is well developed, it's like fast growing, it's one of the Asian miracle, uh, Asian tigers, and so on. But Thailand is just average, just world average, exactly the average. Okay? The countries that are richer than, than average turn to be only Singapore and Malaysia plus Blue Nile, which is the, the oil-rich country. Right? So that's the way that you should try to think that the whole region is still quite uh, underdeveloped. 
uh, on, on average. Okay. So if you want to look at Southeast Asia, and I mentioned that 11 countries, they're so different, how to make sense of it? Okay. Uh, usually we can group Southeast Asia into three subgroups or three categories that you try to uh, tell the story. One is what we call the ASEAN Five, the original five members of, of Association of Southeast Asian Nation. Right? Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, and this one ranked by uh, level of development, income from the highest to, to the lowest. And you have another group right, we call the CLMV that uh, sees Cambodia, El Laos, uh, and Myanmar, and, and Vietnam. Historically, uh, these countries were uh, under centrally planned economy. But later on, they open up the economy, and then after they open up, they start growing quite uh, fast. Right? And this one also ranked by, by income per capita. So you start from Singapore all the way to, to Myanmar, ranked by this. Right? But the uh, distinction between terms of level of income uh, is less and less distinct. Right? Uh, in some measures, actually, Vietnam per capita income is already higher than so you, you start to, to cross that. But uh, it's still good to, to look at the division like this because the economic structure of these countries uh, are different from, from that group. Okay? And then you have two countries that I put together. They are very similar, yet very different. Right? Brunei and Timor-Leste, both are small economies. They depend on petroleum, right? Both are the same. Uh, both depends on sovereign wealth fund. Both have sovereign wealth fund, both Brunei and, and Timor Leste. Uh, the difference is that Brunei is already super rich, but Timor Leste is still very, very poor, the, the poorest one. But the structure of the economy is similar. Right? So, this is the, the landscape that, that uh, I would like to introduce so you get familiar with uh, countries in, in the region. Okay? If you look at the long term uh, perspective, right? the long term growth, start from 1938, right, that's right uh, before the Second World War. Okay. Countries that grow a lot, that's Singapore, right now is like one of the richest countries in the world. Okay. Uh, other countries in Southeast Asia, even the second uh, one is like much lower than, than Singapore. Right. So Singapore is pretty much an outlier in that sense. Singapore uh, start quite low, and then later on even surpass uh, other countries uh, to be uh, the economy higher income than, than the US, than Hong Kong, Taiwan. This is per capita. Okay. The next batch that grow very fast, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, they didn't grow uh, much until the 70s and 80s. And there's a big role of Japan, a Japanese investment that went to uh, this uh, region after the, the Prasa Accord in 1985, that money flowed from, from Japan to, to this region. And then you have the Philippines, uh, which people said is exception of Southeast Asia. It used to have high income than other countries and then get surpassed by Thailand and, and Indonesia. Okay. You have tragedy, and this is the real tragedy. Uh, Myanmar used to start at the beginning of the Second World War, more or less the same level as Thailand, but the economic development turned out to be quite um, uh, uh, problematic in many ways from the from the Second World War all the way to after Second World War and, and so on. But compared to, to Thailand, uh, people say that this is a little bit like an uh, unidentical twins that, that you start the same but different trajectory. Okay. Uh, we can come back to this one if we, if we want to, to discuss about this. Okay. The last batch that I would like to, to throw it here because people used to, right now, you, you, you cannot talk about Southeast Asia without talking about Vietnam. People think that Vietnam is like up and coming, is, is the, the new kid in the block and so on. But Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese economy didn't uh, start to grow until 1990s when they reformed the economy, uh, opened up the economy, and then after that it went, like, it grew very fast, very, very fast. Okay. Uh, similar to uh, Laos and, and Cambodia. But that's more or less coincide with, um, with the end, the collapse of the Cold War, the collapse of the, the Soviet Union. Okay. okay, so if you look at this region, right, and there are so many countries, and I told you that they are different and so on, but is there anything in common that you can learn from, from Southeast Asia? One thing that you can learn from Southeast Asia is that it doesn't matter what happened at the beginning, 
when they became independent right, after the Second World War, uh, later on, all of the countries move in the same direction. And the direction is that they become more open. Right? They used to be closed, then they open. Right? They used to uh, have inward-looking policy, like import substitution. Okay? And then they shift the policy to the export orientation. Okay? So that's inward-looking to outward-looking. They used to have centrally planned economy, and then later on, they shift to market economy. And this includes like, Vietnam and Laos, that, uh, the countries that still have communist party, but they use uh, market economy uh, uh, right now. Right? So it's, the trend is the same. It's just the sequence that the order that happened is different. Right? Countries that shift from import substitution to export promotion uh, are more open uh, and use more and more market economy. Countries that start first turn out to be the country that has highest income as well right now. Right? Singapore uh, shift from import substitution to export promotion first way back in 1965. Right? And now Singapore is the highest uh, income. Followed by whom? Followed by Malaysia, followed by Thailand, followed by Indonesia, and then followed by Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And this is the sequence uh, of the income level as well. The country that shift or open up first turn out to be the country that grow fast and right now has high income. Right? Uh, so that's the, the trend right, that, that we see. Fast forward, these are the, the strategy that, that they use. And right now what we have, right now is that with this strategy export orientation that drive growth, you have very high economic growth and you have industrialization. And the industrialization is focused on export, um, export oriented industrialization. You have people that move from rural area, agriculture, to the urban area during the process of industrialization to work in the factory. So now you have urbanization, right? And with high income, people start to have fewer kids and the economy become uh, aging. So this is what you see. And at the same time, you start to see uh, report, uh, resource uh, deple uh, depletion, right? Because in the past, if you try to think about this region, in contrast to Northeast Asia, like Hong Kong, Korea, Taiwan, or even Japan, uh, Southeast Asia is resource abundant. They have a lot of resources, right? And at the beginning, they used a lot of resources, but now uh, resource is gone. Okay, so that's the problem that, that we're facing right now. Okay, I'm going to skip uh, that that slide, uh, but let me talk about where we are right now. Right? Where we are right now is actually the the outcome of the development strategy. Okay. So if you look at the, uh, the, the goal, the ultimate goal of economic development, um, there are four of them. Okay. The first one uh, we call prosperity, which is you know, like high income, high wealth. This is the prosperity. Okay. And it's the main uh, objective of economic development over the past 50, 60 years. Okay. Another uh, objective that we want to have, not only that the income is higher, but country and, and people should be resilient. Right? When shock happens to, to country, to people, they, they have ability to withstand shock. Or if they fail, they can um, uh, stand up again like very fast. Right? That's resiliency. Uh, we want sustainability, which means that it's not only that you have prosperity today, but you want prosperity in the future as well. Right? So that's sustainability. And you have inclusivity. It means that it's not only that you have economic growth that benefit certain people, but you want that benefit to share among people in the economy. In economics term, uh, if you study some of the, of the economics, these four objectives, sometimes they are conflicting. Right? So in, in economics, we call it uh, that trade-off. Right? So you have trade-off between uh, prosperity, which is income, right? and resiliency, which is uh, stability. So this is the risk-return trade-off. Right? You might have high return, but, you, uh, but that might be high risk as well. If you want uh, resiliency, stability, probably you, you want to grow less, uh, uh, more slowly, but, but more resilient. Prosperity uh, and sustainability is the trade-off over time. Right? It's intertemporal trade-off, whether you want to grow fast today, but the cost is going to be in the future, because you use resource 
or you create debt that you borrow from the future to, to finance uh, growth today or not, right? So that's the, the intertemporal trade-off and also the intergeneral trade-off as well, right? And then you have prosperity and inclusivity, right? Uh, this also trade-off between efficiency and equity, right? So sometimes you, you, you think that uh, efficiency could come from economy of scale. The bigger, the lower the average cost, right? Which means more efficient, but at the same time, uh, if you want some business to be efficient, then that business is going to keep growing because they benefit from, from economy of scale, but that's going to, to be against inclusivity because you have other people uh, left behind, right? So if you want to grow um, with inclusivity, uh, sometimes you have to, to uh, allow more equity and, and lower efficiency, right? So that's economic textbook, right? But in reality, right, these four objectives do not have to be in conflict. We can achieve all of them at the same time. And the key word is that an economy that we are uh, right now, any economy, is inefficient. There are a lot of inefficient in the economy. So sometimes you can solve some inefficiency and you can in, in, uh, improve like this objective at the same time. Right? One of the policies is that if you uh, provide financial access to uh, small business, right, then they can produce more, that's inclusivity, increase uh, inclusivity and, and also increase prosperity. Right? So these are the objectives. Right? The problem also is Asia that I mentioned in, in the previous slide is that we have seen high growth in Southeast Asia and now high income in many countries. But the symptom that we observe right now is that growth that we have observed in the past, high growth, start to slow. Right? So that creates concern whether prosperity is going to be granted. Okay? Southeast Asia use export-oriented industrialization. It means that they export a lot, right? which means that they have to depend on the rest of the world, depends on the global economy. And when something happens in the world, they get hit as well. So that strategy creates volatility and crisis. Okay? And that uh, raises concern on, on resiliency of these uh, countries. They use a lot of resources okay, from agriculture that they use at the beginning, right? soil degradation, they, uh, deforestation, and all of those things, uh, to grow in the first place. And then that creates sustainability problems that they might not be able to do. Uh, in the long term. And then there's uh, large inequality. We, we can talk about this during Q&A. Um, one thing that is similar in Southeast Asia and in Hong Kong is about business tycoon. Right? So a lot of uh, growth turn out to benefit some of the business families, but not um, the rest of the country. So you have that, that problem. Okay? So when you look at this, uh, the growth strategy that they use in, in the past turn out to be the factor that create growth and high income uh, that they experience right now, but at the same time, the exact economic development uh, strategy that they use create all of the concerns that we are going to, uh, to deal with today. Okay. Start with uh, this one. We keep talking about growth of this country, growth miracle, Asian miracle, but all of the countries in Southeast Asia, with, with few exceptions, have been experiencing economic growth slowdown. Okay. We talk about Singapore, high income, high growth, some of the years grow like two digits, but no longer. Okay. If you look at uh, 1991 to 95, that's before Asian financial uh, bar, and then 2001, 2010, that's after Asian financial crisis. And then the last one is the last decade, 2011 to 2020. Right? Three periods, you find the average growth rate, it dropped. Okay. Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, all of the countries we see that growth has been slower. So you can think that this is going to be the same as, I as in the past. Okay? Same as other countries, growth has been slowed down, and it's not the world, right? The world is not experiencing that. So it means that there is something, it's like a time bomb that we have to deal with. Okay? Growth has been volatile and vulnerable, the top one is about uh, growth of ASEAN 5 year by year. On average, it's high. Like most of the time, it's about 5% per year. But once in a while, you're going to see 
negative growth right here, right here, right here, right here. And that negative growth uh, episode turned out to be uh, coincide with something that happened to the world, right? Because you depend a lot on the world. When something happened in the world, then you get hit as well. So this is the problem, okay? And why is that? Because that export-oriented industrialization is the key to growth, but at the same time, it's also the key that make this region vulnerable. Okay? Um, the, the openness of this uh, region is huge. Almost all of the countries in this region, they, they have openness like above the, the world average. Okay? So, I will go fast on this one, because this one is the challenge that we are going to see uh, right now. Um, four challenges that, that, we, that we observe. I'm going to go one by one, but uh, a little bit fast. Okay. The first one is about demographic transition. So East Asia is the region that population aged fastest in the world. Okay. Comparable or even faster than even China, and China has one child policy, right? As far as uh, same as uh, Japan. Right? So when you look at this region, fertility rate has been declined in all economies, and in many economies, the fertility rate is already below the replacement rate, which means that the population is going to shrink in the future. Okay. Singapore, right, uh, below since 1975, followed by Thailand, and then uh, and then Vietnam and Malaysia, right. So people think about Vietnam as the future, right? But behind the scene, Vietnam has been aging as well, and the impact of population aging is going to come to haunt Vietnamese economy very soon. The problem about this region is that, with the exception of Singapore, they become very old, they age very fast, but their income is still not high. We talk about Japan or Europe, right? Age uh, economies, yes. They're aging, they're already aged, but they age at the high income level. So the government and people have financial means to, to finance the old age population. But these countries, they're not even rich yet. So they get old before they become rich, and that's the problem. Okay? This one is the same message, population pyramid, uh, compared to 2020, 2050, uh, 30 years from today, you start to see that it's not pyramid anymore, it's just weird shape because population shrink like crazy, right? And these are the uh, five countries that have fertility rate of below replacement rate. And I'm not going to talk about the consequence of this, I think everyone knows, or we can talk about that, but this is something that is going to happen for sure. I don't know any country in the world that has public policy that is successful to make people have more, man uh, more, more kids. No, right? Uh, Singapore tried a lot, right? Sending like married couple to Bali and honeymoon, and hopefully they, they have more kids. Uh, fail, right? And and if Singapore fail, other country cannot do it, right? I, I think Singapore is a high benchmark. That yes, yeah, we come back to that one. Yeah, but uh, Scandinavia is a, a little bit different. But but uh, even right when you are successful, right? It's very hard to make people have more kids. But even when they are successful, that baby will take 20 years to enter the labor market. So it's not going to solve the, uh, the, the problem that we're going to have in the next 20 years. You're going to have the problem with the labor market no matter what, right? Uh, so uh, the solution is what, like a couple of people said, that, well, you have to improve the quality of labor and people, uh, or you have to accept uh, immigration, which is another issue, okay? Other countries start to, to experience the same thing, but not, uh, not as severe as, as those first, okay? Climate change, okay? So it's Asia is the hot spot for problems from climate change, okay? For three reasons, being in the tropic, right? You have the, in, in the, the, the area with tropical storm, you have long coastline, of course, you're gonna get hit, right? And then you have dense population in economic activities in the coastal and flood prone area. And that's pretty much by design, because the cities in Southeast Asia, are, uh, they, they were founded as port city during the colonial time. Southeast Asia location itself 
has been center for commerce. Right? Because it's located between China and, uh, and Japan on one side and India. And it, throughout centuries, it has been a commercial hub. And of course, commercial hub, it means that they build ports near the, the coast, and that's the problem right now. Right? So when you have uh, climate change, right, that's going to be the problem. Right? So these are the, the hot spots right, who, who get hit. Philippines is very dark because that, that's the typhoon, the typhoon belt come hit here. So temperature is rising. Right? At the end of this century, it's going to be like a lot of red. That's bad. Right? And this is not only for human uh, inhabitat or human settlement, but it's also food production. The Southeast Asia is the food producer that supply food to the world. So this is the problem. Okay? Precipitation is also changing uh, a lot. Okay? Related to China, uh, now uh, you have water froze. Right? Snow melt in China will, will flow to this region, and it's becoming uh, less and less uh, controllable. Okay? most vulnerable uh, to rising sea level. The Greenland, the Antarctica, uh, uh, ice sheet melt, and then sea level rise. And so you say, yeah, this is red, this is the worst one. Okay. Um, so this one is weighted by, by population, vulnerable population, because a lot of people living along the coastline. So, so this is like very, very bad. Okay. This one uh, is depressing. <laughs> okay. Rising sea level, uh, we post imminent to millions of people. There's big city in Southeast Asia, as you mentioned, located right along the, the coastline. Okay? So 40, uh, 54% of population in, in Yangon, in Rangoon, in, in Burma, is going to get, get impacted by, by ri rising sea level that's going to flood the, the delta. 96% of people in Bangkok uh, will get impacted. Okay? Uh, this one is uh, Ho Chi Minh City uh, at the Mekong uh, Delta. Uh, Manila, which is uh, along the bay, the Manila Bay, uh, Jakarta, which is not only rising sea level, but the city is also sinking. And then Singapore is 12%, but still impacted. Right? So you see that the impact is quite huge. And so far, they haven't done anything much. And they cannot prevent the rising sea level by themselves. It's a global problem. Okay? Shifting geopolitics. Okay? Uh, we talk a lot about rise, uh, the rise of China. Okay? I summarize the rise of China into uh, five Ds. China helped development in Southeast Asia, building the pipeline, infrastructure, and so on. Uh, but at the same time, it made countries in Southeast Asia depend more and more with China. Trade volume with China is huge. Okay? And, and also, um, uh, investment is getting higher. It created debt for this country, especially Laos uh, and, and uh, Cambodia. Okay? It created discontent in some of the events like China uh, build dams on, on the upper Mekong River that control the flow of the river, right? and of course, uh, and dispute like the South China Sea. So basically, the rise of China comes with, with both uh, the plus and, and the minus side for, for this region. And then it creates the tension. Right? We, we talk about uh, US-China, right? um, uh, and so we say she's right in the middle. Okay? So the, the stance, uh, from Southeast Asia and all of the countries that they keep saying the same thing is that don't let us choose. Okay? They don't want to choose a uh, side. Okay? And when I talk to people from China, gov uh, Chinese government and also US government, they say that they don't want Southeast Asia to choose either because they're not sure which side Southeast Asia or particular country will choose if they, they were forced to choose. Okay? Another uh, issue at risk is, um, I will spend a little bit of time on this one, is what we call the ASEAN centrality. Each country in Southeast Asia is small, small open economy, they don't have power as much, but they tie together through ASEAN, right, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And somehow, as uh, diplomats from Southeast Asia keep saying, ASEAN itself is dysfunctional. It's paper tiger. It doesn't have real power, yet it consists of 10 countries, and there are two uh, principles of ASEAN that all of the members have to follow. One is non-interference of other countries. Whatever happened in other countries, ASEAN will not intervene in the domestic issue, which means that they say nothing about what happened in Myanmar and human rights in that country, this country. Second is that whatever comes out of ASEAN has to be consensus. And you have to get consensus from 10 countries that are so different. 
So usually you cannot get right uh, a lot of uh, resolution from ASEAN. But diplomats from ASEAN say that the strength uh, or the weakness of ASEAN is actually ASEAN strength. Because the fact that ASEAN is paper tiger make the superpower willing to collaborate with ASEAN because they're not, uh, they, they don't fear that ASEAN is going to take over something. Right? So that's going to be uh, what we call the ASEAN centrality. What happened uh, between ASEAN and the superpower, ASEAN has been always the center. Right? For example, right, these are the, the ASEAN countries, uh, ten, 10 countries. Right? And then we have uh, what we call ASEAN plus three. Right? That's why ASEAN is center, because it's ASEAN plus. ASEAN plus three means ASEAN 10 countries plus China, uh, Japan, Korea. Right? And then they have ASEAN plus six, which is ASEAN plus three, plus Australia, New Zealand, and India. So it's always ASEAN as the center. That's what we call ASEAN centrality. Right? And it has been uh, the, the backbone of, of how the, the region operate in the past. And that makes the, the region strong. Right? right now, ASEAN centrality is at risk because the conflict between um, China and US that draw each member in different directions. Right? Uh, the conflict in the South China Sea, you have Vietnam, you have Philippines that have indirect conflict with China, right? And you have other countries that don't involve, don't get involved in this conflict, like Cambodia and Thailand and so on, right? So when the issue of um, uh, relationship with, with China or South China Sea goes to, to ASEAN, you have, you cannot get consensus, and that's the problem, right? Same thing as economic um, cooperation, you have ASEAN, 10 countries that has ASEAN free trade area. But then some of the members start to go with CPTPP, some mem members go to, to ASEP and so on. So basically you start to, to get dragged into different directions. Okay. So uh, the role of ASEAN is not going to be as strong as before. The last one is technology disruption. Right? It creates opportunity and it creates uh, challenges. Okay. Um, it's going fast. Right? I uh, show you um, the unicorn in Southeast Asia, just over the year, 2021 and 2022, it's growing a lot. Right now, they, they are about like 50 something, 56 uh, unicorn in, in Southeast Asia, and they also a uh, decacorn in, in Southeast Asia, four of them. Right? So they're growing. Right? The problem is that these are concentrated in Singapore, yeah? uh, mainly in Singapore, followed by, guess what, uh, Indonesia. Singapore has about, like, um, I think, 20 something, 30, Indonesia has 15, 16. Okay. So, Singapore is world class location for startup, but others still are behind. The ranking for, for startup ecosystem, Singapore ranked number eight in the world. And the rest is like 50 something. Okay. So, there's room for, for improvement. Okay. So, if you want to look into the future, right, asking me uh, what opportunities in, in Southeast Asia that, that we should look at. Um, opportunities come from two sources. One is from competitive advantage. And competitive advantage of Southeast Asia always remain the same thing, which is geography, right? the location. Okay. Uh, another opportunity comes from inefficiency. Right? When you look at e economy that has so many problems, don't be pessimistic, right? it means that there are a lot of things that could improve the, the economy. So the more inefficiency you have, the more opportunity you have. Like for example, the, the Ben Google Temasek report, I take the, the 2019 one, uh, not the most recent one, because I think this one represents the message quite well. Um, they said that more than 70% of adult population is either underbanked or uh, unbanked in Southeast Asia. Right? So it means that this huge opportunity that you can uh, go there and uh, improve the, the life of people over there and at the same time make, make money of your own. Okay. Uh, this one, okay, back to location. In real estate, we say location, location, location. So it's Asia, of course, location is not going to go anywhere and that's always their uh, advantage. Okay. Located between China and India, and we know that China and India, there are a lot of conflicts between, between these two. Having China and India in the same, on the same um, negotiation um, table uh, need third party, and so we say she quite served uh, that role quite well, right? Uh, third largest economy after India and China, and they are all connected in, in the Indo-Pacific. Right? So that's uh, pretty much the overview of, uh, of Southeast Asia in, 
I would say half an hour, but I, I went to 35 minutes. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chris. Uh, we'll be taking questions for the next 20 minutes. And just to kick start, uh, Dr. Chris, if we could go to slide 38. Uh, there is something interesting there uh, that prompts uh, a question in my mind. So if you look at the comparative advantage, and if the Southeast Asian economies, which are export-oriented now, they're going to increase uh, resource extraction. You know, that's going to create a paradox with sustainability goals. Likewise, in terms of you know, increasing capital access, that will increase consumption among the population. And that's also contrary to the sustainability goals or makes it harder to find that balance. So maybe you can share with us you know, what are the policy interventions you are seeing uh, which governments are trying to bring to bear to you know, address that uh, paradox between sustainability and growth. So uh, one thing that, that people usually say when, when they talk about uh, economic development is structural transformation. And people usually link uh, or explain tra structural transformation as moving from agriculture uh, or primary sector to industry and to service and so on. Right? I think right now the way that we should see structural transformation is not something that moves from agriculture to manufacturing and service. But we should see the move within sector. Right? Service Asia used to uh, produce agriculture, primary agriculture. Right, rice and all of those things, and they start moving to cash crops. The next step is to go agriculture, but high-tech agriculture, like using um, uh, technology to do precise farming, to do all of those uh, agri-tech. So basically, that, that's the way to go. Same as service sector that they used to do, like just tourism, right, which cannot scale. The more you scale tourism, it means that you deplete more natural resources. But you have to go like with... Um, uh, the high value uh, service sector and basically try to get value added in each activity. So I think that the policy, uh, going back to, to your question, the policy that the government should pursue or private sector should pursue is try to think about technology, for example, mm -hmm. especially digital technology, AI, for example, how to use that technology to incorporate into the, the competitive advantage that, the, that the, the region has in the first place. The region has competitive advantage in producing food, how to incorporate technology to improve that production so that you don't deplete more of the fertility from the, uh, from the soil and, and all those things. So I think uh, rather than creating, and, and this is something that drives me crazy because you talk to you know, National Economic Planning Board in some of these countries and then they come up like, oh, we would like to be a uh, hub of robotics but to be half for aerospace, right? And then that's good if you can do it, but it's against your competitive advantage, right? So instead of like investing in something that you don't have competitive advantage, like add on uh, something, and then basically that's going to, to, you already have the jump start on that one. Yeah. Sure, so essentially you're saying improving efficiency in whatever they're doing. In or the innovation sector. within whatever that they're, they're innovation doing. Innovation right? technology. Yeah. Excellent. So we have lots of questions. We'll start with the gentleman here and then. OK. Well, thank you very much indeed. My name is Andrew Leung. I'm an in independent China strategist. Um, now, there is a saying that when elephants fight, the grass get trembled. Um, and of course, with the two elephants, um, United States and China, uh, inevitably affecting Southeast Asia. So my question to you is, firstly, how do the Southeast Asian countries negotiate or navigate these choppy waters, uh, particularly as regards the risking or decoupling? Um, and also, how do these countries exactly respond to the demographics, as China is, uh, by embracing the fourth industrial revolution in terms of um, Internet of Things and e-commerce and so on. So exactly how they are faring. So I think that's a double barrel question. Thank you very much. I think uh, the 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 conflict uh, between China and, and and US. I think this region get like dragged uh, by, by by both sides. But when when you talk to them, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they make it clear they're not going to choose, and they're not choosing, and both countries are not pushing them 
to choose either, right? So what happened is that how they're going to navigate this? Uh, there are two ways that they're doing right now. One is bilateral, and the other one is multilateral through through ASEAN, right? The the role of ASEAN start to to come back to this one because they start to see that uh, if you go one country, then it's hard to say no when uh, say China requests something or when the U.S. requests something. But if you go as a pack, because given that ASEAN is so dysfunctional, they can say that we need solution, resolution on, on this one. And it's kind of like buying time, to, uh, which means that you can keep buying time like for a long time. right? So, uh, and, and in that case, it happened to, to many things. Like uh, resolution on, on South China Sea, basically, I don't think that there's going to be any definite resolution uh, at the end. Um, uh, it's going to keep dragging for, for a long time. Uh, economic is the same. Right? And I think uh, that's the, the strategy that a lot of countries are, are, are pursuing. Um, the second one is Internet of Things. Um, this region is quite interesting because the, the, in, uh, the technology adoption is very, very fast. And you try to think about other countries that adopt uh, technology like mobile phone and other things way in the past. A lot of countries adopt that uh, for a long time. But Swiss Asia in the past has been quite a little bit like be, uh, behind, but COVID hit, and that accelerated a lot of adoption. Okay, so when that hit, and now you have a lot of people that, that uh, pretty much use uh, cell phone and tablet almost everywhere. Right, so I'm not worried about the penetration of Internet of Things in Swiss Asia. What I'm worried is the production of technology whether Southeast Asia is going to be uh, becoming more and more relying on foreign technology without producing their own uh, or not. Right? Because using technology, I think that's not, that's not an issue. Producing technology is, is another completely different issue. And that one, they're far behind. Right? Look at uh, Vietnam. People talk about uh, EV in Vietnam. Right? WinFast went to, to list in, in the US and so on. Uh, but when people look at WinFast, they said that technology is still foreign technology. Uh, so it's not uh, indigenous, it's not Vietnamese technology. Like how fast they can move away from relying on foreign technology to creating their own technology, I think that's the challenge that, that is at the, at the stake and, and, and not like the, the adoption of technology per se. Yeah. So I'm worried about the production side, not the consumption side, to summarize the, the answer. Unintended, uh, I would say, positive effects. For example, the conflict between China and, uh, and the U.S. or the tensions there uh, has resulted in a lot of uh, Western and European firms relocating their operations to Southeast Asia, and that's really triggered the growth of uh, markets like Vietnam and Vietnam. Indonesia of late. And we're seeing the same in the tech sector. You know, big data center footprints, everything moving to Southeast Asia. And that region, you're right, they're sandwiched between the two elephants, but just being swing states, they don't take sides, they're just benefiting from both positive relationships between US and China and you know, whenever they have tension. And, and again, um, location uh, play a role, right? Basically, a lot of uh, relocation just close from, from China to, to Vietnam. Uh, industrial zone in northern Vietnam is not far from, from the border, so that's why like, Vietnam benefit quite a lot too. Thanks for the interesting presentation and the valuable insights. My name is Mo and I'm from Egypt and I work in the public policy domain. And actually I'm very interested in Southeast Asia for many different reasons, mainly because I see it's, it would be the safe bet in the future when it comes into investments. I can understand that the region is the least vulner vulnerable uh, region for the rising sea levels, but when it comes into economy, I see it from a different perspective. Yes, it's like all the other economies that faced many challenges through the lockdown in the aftermath of coronavirus, given the fact that, as you mentioned, it's export-oriented uh, economies. But last year, I think the situation has turned down up when many different economies has reached a high growth rate. For example, Philippines has recorded uh, around 8%, one of the top five highest, highest uh, growing growth rate. 
since 1976. Philippines, uh, Thailand reached plus 5%, so the recovery pace is very high. From there, I would like to bring a perspective on regional integration of Asian countries, because there are five levels of regional integration. It started by free trade agreement, and ASEAN achieved that. Second, customs union, and I think it's progressing very, very fast. Common market, and I think here, uh, common market, then economic uh, union, and then political union. European Union has succeeded to pass all the five stages, still it has now a military union. When it comes into ASEAN, it's now in the early stages of the third level, which is common market. So in the, in the near future, it should uh, go faster to have a, an economic union and common government and one monetary policy and so on. So my question, and as Sanjeev mentioned, that the, there are, because of the supply chain disruption, it worked in favor of ASEAN nation. It increased the investment and even China plus one policy has worked in favor of Vietnam and Indonesia and other countries in the region. So my question, how can we accelerate integration? I understand, you, yes, it's a matter of time, but I think in the next decade, uh, uh, given the current geopolitical situation, we need to accelerate things. So how can we accelerate the regional integration between Asian nations? Thank you. So. Uh Integration, of course, right? In general, integration, we say that in, in aggregate, on average, it benefits economy, right? This is like free trade and so on. The issue is that whatever that is easy, is already done, right? That's why after ASEAN free trade area, after uh, agreement was signed, a few years, 99.9% .9 of, the, um, of the items has tariffed to zero. The problem is that that 1% that they cannot agree on, those are the difficult ones, right? And those are the ones that are politically uh, related, right? So basically, the, the, the problem is that uh, the East one has already done, right? Right now, it's the difficult one, and how to do it at the end is politics. For example, there are two areas that you cannot push forward as fast. One is agriculture, because even though this region, countries set aside Singapore, has higher income, but a lot of people still in agricultural sector. And that's the constituency for politics in this country. Right? So to open up uh, trade on agriculture, that's very sensitive. Right? And that's why like, uh, Thailand can, uh, doesn't want to join CPTPP, is agriculture. Right? Another one, uh, in addition to agriculture, is service sector. That's the sector that they protect a lot and they don't want to open it up, right? And again, it's political, and as long as political issues in this region is not stabilized, then that's going to be very difficult to move forward to that one, right? So you have to, to get, you know, like political development settled enough uh, to, to, to go to that point, right? And that's why like, Indonesia right now, uh, a lot of policy becomes like, easier because uh, politics is, is a little bit more under control. But in other countries, political situation is in reverse direction. Malaysia, we used to say that one good thing about Malaysia is stable politics. Right? UMNO has been controlling the country since independence and so on. But in the past 10 years, it showed that UMNO is not that strong anymore. So political stability turned out to be uh, something that Malaysia used to enjoy and, 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 and it's no longer. So a lot of policy is, is going to be more difficult to, to push forward. Yeah. So we can say that the political values or the values are higher by example of the regional integration of regional integration. Yeah. So it's a political issue and it's going to be much greater than accelerating the integration. Yeah. Yeah. So at the end, it's yeah, it's hard to talk about economics without politics, and, and basically today we have been abstract on that one way, I think like behind the scene it's all, it's all about politics. Yeah. Hi, my name is MC Wong, I'm, I'm not an academic, so I'm just a, a retired accountant. Thank you very much for an interesting uh, subject. Uh, two questions. One, when I looked at the fertility rate, I noticed that Indonesia is not on the list. So can you tell us how that um, growth rate there affects? And my second question, is that you talk about inefficiencies. Um, uh, and it's really interesting to see, as, 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 um, the Southeast Asian countries as a block and how it features in the international stage. To what extent 
is these inefficiencies caused by its lack of ability by its government. And then I, when I say inefficiency in government, it's bringing wealth to a nation and spreading it across the population. And one particular example as a beneficiary of the incompetence of the Philippine government is that for 30 or 40 years, it exports its women to, to benefit the rest of us so that we can have a better life. To what extent is the inefficiency of these governments in bringing wealth to its nation causing the lack of progress? So, so the, the first question, I think, uh, uh, because the second question is, is very difficult. <laughs> let, let me answer the first question. Indonesia fertility rate has been going down as well, right? But it's not on the list uh, because right now it's still above 2%. So it's not, but if you come back to that slide in the next few years, it's going to, to be like quite low, right? One of the reasons is that Indonesia is a Muslim country. So fertility rate in, uh, in Indonesia has been uh, going down like slower than, than other country. Another country that fertility rate has been coming down uh, more slowly is the, um, is the Philippines, actually, because of the uh, religion uh, uh, reason, because of the, um, the Catholic uh, uh, doctrine. And the second uh, question that you, you talk about inefficiency uh, from the government, right? So there are a lot of inefficiency in, in the Philippines in the first place. That's why the Philippines had economic problem way back, right? Uh, and, and it showed up in, in the 70s. And actually, exporting labor of the Philippines uh, is a unique situation, right? I, I travel around the world and, and I talk to uh, people in many countries. People in many countries, they want to get out of the country because they want to go somewhere else that has economic opportunity better than in the country, even though the home government doesn't want them to leave because they're considered as brain drain. The Philippines is not the same, the Philippines, the government actually encouraged people to go out, right? Since um, the policy is from, from Marcos because they, they face two, two economic problems. One is high unemployment uh, because of inefficiency in, in labor market and the economy. And the other one uh, uh, is the, the balance of payment crisis. They need foreign currency. The policy that can solve this problem at the same time is exporting labor. Because exporting labor, people send back uh, money back. So that turned out to be the, the policy that even uh, recent government still encourage people to do it, right? Because they see that this is the, the way that help remedy the, the problem within the country. The problem is that now you have brain drain. You have doctors from the Philippines that uh, go work in other countries and, and use not skill knowledge that, that they have. And people in the Philippines turn out to not benefit from that human capital of that people. So it's, it's brain drain problem, that, that's, the, that's the cost. Uh, that keep going on and that's still inefficiency. Uh, but the government doesn't even try to reverse that because in the short term, if they try to reverse that, they're going to face a kind of problem in the short term, even though it benefits the long-term problem. Yeah. So it's self-fulfilling still. Yeah, hi, this is Prasoon from India. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, one slide you talk about the startup ecosystem. I just wanted to know, is there any regional uh, startup promotion uh, policy within these countries? And what are the best case scenarios, uh, cross-border cooperation in startup ecosystem? Thank you. I don't think that it's uh, cross-border cooperation as much. Um, uh, it's a little bit like country, national uh, specific that, that, they, that they do it. And actually, they're actually competing, which is good. Right? Competition is good. But they're competing a lot of startups in Southeast Asia. Uh, when when we look at at the list, um, that's uh, this list is when when I show this one, usually it caused me trouble. That's why I try to show it fast because people will cause me trouble. Because what is Southeast Asia? What is Singapore? Right. So you have like Grab that start from Malaysia and then respond and then go list uh, uh, in actually in the U.S. Right. Uh, or uh, you have uh, some company that investor from certain country and then went to list in Singapore and it covers Singapore, uh, or uh, some startup in Indonesia, owners turn out to be from Thailand and Malaysia. So it's hard to, to see this, but you see the landscape that people just go where the opportunity are. And that's why Indonesia is huge right here, because people see first huge inefficiency in Indonesia. Uh, one is that the level of development is lower than 
say like Singapore, Malaysia, uh, but another one is innate to Indonesia, because Indonesia has a lot of islands. So by geography of Indonesia itself, you have problems. So the tech come in and, and tech doesn't have borders, so you can have virtual bank that doesn't have to open branch in each island that is very costly. So that's one thing about Indonesia. Inefficiency is huge. Uh, not always the, the problem of Indonesian government, but geography, but also population, right? Uh, you, you have to invest a lot in this startup. And in Indonesia, you have huge population. Uh, just a few percent of Indonesian population that use your product, you're going to make tons of money compared to some countries that, uh, that you uh, don't have that, that mass. So right now, a lot of, uh, one trend that I see is that a lot of companies start to open in either Singapore, because infrastructure is great, or Indonesia, because the domestic market is huge. And once they start to settle, they start to grow, then they expand to open like branch and, or, or business in other countries in Southeast Asia. You're not going to observe or see startup in Cambodia. But you're going to see startup in Indonesia, in Singapore, start operating in Cambodia. And I think that's the, I'm not sure whether that's cooperation or not, but I think that's the, yeah, linked to, to your question. Are we still taking one more question? Oh, there are two people interested. Right. Can we still take? Sure. Let's take one more question, and that's from the lady here. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for the insightful presentation. Uh, I'm Clary Lowe. I used to work at the Hong Kong government on financial services. There's a slide about the lack of banking in this region. Why is that? Is it the government policy, or is that the uh, banks do not dare to go to these countries? Thank you. Um, I think the answer is, is very simple. I think the risk is very high. Uh, and most of the unbanked, they are in rural area, and a lot of population in Indonesia, as mentioned, they are located in like, remote islands, so it's not worth the cost of the, of the bank to open the branch and make loan to these people in the first place. Right? So that the cost is just too high. And given that the cost is, is very high, credit cost, you don't even know like, whether the client is good or bad because they don't have any credit history. Uh, and once you make loan, you cannot audit. Right? So in the first place, then they don't do it. Right? So, so that's why uh, banks in Southeast Asia grow up in the first place from doing business with corporate clients, but not retail clients, because the, the fixed cost of doing business with retail uh, turned to be quite high, yeah, and, and that explained that. But that quote uh, was from, intentionally, it was from 2019. So if you fast forward to 2022, same report from Ben Google Temasek, uh, they said like huge progress has been going on in this region, and the accelerator uh, turned out to be COVID. Uh, because people adopt technology like very fast. And once people adopt technology, it's not that people know how to use the app, the device, and so on, but banks or um, tech company get more data from people as well. So they can evaluate or access um, uh, credit rating uh, much better, and then that uh, lead to like more, more loans and so on. Yeah. Yes, I mean, especially the likes of Gojek, because they, were, they started off with uh, being a transportation provider or a mobility provider, but now they have gone big with microfinancing uh, in Indonesia. So they have so microfinance. If yes. you want to buy like car uh, or motorcycle, you can do that, and they also sell insurance. Yes. I guess it's linked. They have like history, right? Like how many accidents you, you have and all those things. Like uh, they don't know your habit, what time you wake up in the morning and work. I mean, these are like the super apps of Southeast Asia. Think of yeah. them like the WeChat or the other apps here you see in China. Southeast Asia, Gojek, and Grab, they're dominating all parts of B2C from capital and consumer services. And, and Gojek actually merged uh, yeah. with uh, Toko Tokopedia. So now it's, uh, it's uh, go to. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chris, for this very, I would say, data backed. Uh, and very rich, insightful session on Southeast Asia and what lies uh, in the future for, for a very important economic region in Asia and the world. So with that, you know, let's uh, just give a round of applause.
Thank you very much.